So I took a moment to prop up the banding wheel so that way I could have it at an angle for you all to see a little bit better here. Um, I'm about to start decorating into the clay. One of the things that I love about transferring onto leather hard clay, I've got this imagery. Now I can push and pull, draw into, add to um, with a layered surface, with a transferred image surface. So if you use some tissue transfers out there, some of them are so detailed that you may not be able to do anything extra to it. You may not even be able to put your own voice uh, in addition to the information that's there with it or it might feel forced. Um, some of you feel dependent about putting imagery onto bisque surfaces or bone dry. What I love about the leather hard is that I still have a lot of room for play, as I just said about addition, subtracting, cutting into. So I keep my decorative tools now really simple. As I showed at the beginning of the video, I've got this fondant tool. The fondant tool has a dash line, has a pokey um, edge that will create more of like little dotted lines. I use my Kemper tool that has like, like a cleanup tool. I believe it is K20 is the number. And then I just use a pen. Look clicky pen because I want to use the end of the pen to make the circles. So on the plate that I had made prior to coming and demo in, you'll see that the edge all has hard lines. And it's amazing what a simple design element can do to change the composition of a piece. I used to only do solid lines and then and use a little bit of whimsy and play from a dashed line. And now, I just, I've gone back to it. I like how a line can really define an edge, define a space. I love how a dashed line is like a call to action. I see a lot of artists out there using dashed lines, and it's a part of a process that I would, I'm gonna use this as an example. Why? I know that sometimes it's really important to understand like why not, let's just do it. But there's, as, as artist and potter Ben Carter told me once is that there's an important time for uh, making and there's an important time for thinking. Don't always bring the two together, but stop afterwards and take a moment of reflection and ask yourself questions. And so for like a dashed line, I see a lot of um, potters out there who may have read graphic clay, have taken a workshop, have done more, and, and they really enjoy the image of, or, or the line that is made from a dashed line. And that's fine. Sometimes it's just about because it sparks joy. We may not understand why. Um, but ask yourself from time to time, like, wonder what it is about it. I'll tell you, for, personally for me, like a dashed line is that call to action that I mentioned. But it also represents like a, a running stitch that you might find on quilts or old quilts or clothes, embroidery, thinking of like Western shirts um, when they have all the extra little um, embroidery floss um, and designs and decor. I love how I've got two patterns meeting that a stitched line naturally because of just like its history is a natural way to blend those two um, patterns that might feel forced. This helps make it feel a little bit more natural. Um, also a dashed line, think of like a treasure map. You're gonna follow the dashed line to get to the buried treasure. Also cut along the dotted line, follow the dotted line. There's just so much um, weight in history to that one graphic element. That's what I love about it. And that's why I continue to use it. So I'm going to use this dashed line on this plate, but I'm also going to use my pen to create some gold points, uh, a couple circles where if you were to follow the dashed line, you get a little gold treat. But why gold? Why would you use gold? I'll tell you why I use gold in a second. So I'm going to add a dot on the rim where the yellow and the blue meet. Do a couple spontaneously on the rim, but I am being observant and mindful of other design elements. There's an orange dot right here. I might put a circle there to play off that, but I'm also gonna look for empty areas there, one, two, three, four, let's do one in the blue, odd numbers. Let's do one in the seam here. Where can it play? Maybe right where 
there. I love how that dot now plays with the circles. So I'm working intuitively, but making um, within those decisions, I'm not just working with my gut. I don't know what to say here. I'm making conscious decisions when I'm putting the circles down. They're intentional of where they're going, but I'm trying to find a balance of like where my gut is telling me to put them. Um, and so I'm responding to the information that has been provided from the image and the transfer. So now using my dash tool, I'm going to carefully rotate the banding wheel along the rim. All right, and so already that dashed line is so different than the hard line. It almost has this like look because of the volume of the rim, it almost feels like plush, like a stuffed animal almost. This is my favorite stage of the process is this leather hard. Um, once it's bisque, it feels cold and I don't wanna say dead, but it's just, there's this fragility to it, but there seems to be life in it when there's moisture in it. And I just, the, the tactility, the feel, um, your senses really get a, a hold of it. So this is one of the times within my process that I feel very present with the work. So I'm gonna continue on with some of the dashed line. Um, as I was talking about like a call to action, a dashed line can help suggest that some of these stars are a shooting star. And so carrying a dashed line, maybe going behind that white star, picking up the trailed line, you get this play, but does the star come out from underneath the blue layer or is there a shift in imagery? Do you do one line? Do you do several? I oftentimes have an idea of where I'm going to start, but I don't have everything figured out. Um, this allows me to remain engaged. As a person, I need something to hold my attention. Um, and this is one way that I've been able to figure it out. So I'm gonna do one more cross line. This one won't go to any star. This one's just gonna interrupt the image. We'll just continue it. And it just naturally happens to hit one of the gold dots. So the thing with the gold dots, for the longest time, I didn't understand why I liked it. I've tried making work without gold luster or without the gold dots, and even years later, it feels very unfinished. And finally, something made sense to why I, I make this surface, um, the surface decoration or this element of adornment. I believe it has a lot to do with my personal narrative of having a past of five years in military school. I was shipped off to military school in, uh, for eighth grade and graduated. And not having any formal art training, our uniforms were sort of our canvas. Uh, from the medals to the shine shoes to the ribbons and I just re always remember stripping the buttons of this lacquer and that way I could give them a better shine and, and there's just something always about these gold brass uh, buttons on our, on our jackets and just blinging them out and I, I honestly believe that that is why I love having little gold, uh, what some people will say are rivets, to me they're just little gold medals um, sprinkled throughout. And so I try to find a nice balance of placement. And occasionally I'll add little dots into the work as well. So that one, I'd consider the top finished. Again, here is the previous one. I'm gonna add some dots in here. And the thing that I love about dots 
is that you can suggest pattern by spacing out individual dots, the proximity of maybe you have groups of three dots, do, do you fill maybe one of the stars with dots and that's going to give that star, it's gonna stand out a little bit more from the rest. Do you have it by itself? Do you add um, some dots in another star? But the thing with dots is there's this like comfort, there's this understanding uh, with what dots can add to a piece. And the work that I'm looking for, the look, I'm sorry, the look that I'm working for is as if I've reached inside a 90s Nickelodeon television show or the cartoons I used to watch as a kid. So a lot of my aesthetic, a lot of my work is really about how did illustrators and cartoonists create an atmosphere for Rugrats, for Rocco's Modern Life, for Ren and Stimpy, Hey Arnold, you know, were you, how were you able to reach in and bring that into your own space? Uh, I grew up with a single mom working all the time and so the television was both my babysitter my entertainment and I grew up with like melamine plates um, that were rich with pattern and color um, TV dinners uh, easy casseroles stuff like that so I'm really hoping to bring a lot of my Americana and nostalgia and the essence of what I remember my childhood curiosities being into the work that I make today to finish up, I'm going to address the bottom of the plate. To do that, I like to use, so I don't throw my plates, I hand build. Um, and I use these plaster molds that I've made to make plates. Just to protect the imagery and the drawn lines, I'm going to place this a little bit of sponge down, place the mold, flip. And now I'm going to decorate the bottom. I see a lot of potters out there that won't like glaze the bottom. They won't really do anything but sign. As someone who went to school originally for graphic design, everything should be considered. There should be play on the bottom. I'm gonna treat the bottom like I did the top. So I might do, that's the dashed line. I'm gonna do a straight line around the rim here. And you can be as involved, engaged with the bottom I do keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> simple, my definition of simple and other people's uh, definition of simple are probably completely different. So I'm gonna add a straight edge because I wanna reflect what's going on in the front. And if that line's not perfect, we're human. It's one of the things that I love about hand-built pots um, and the mark making, the human hand being involved. My favorite pots that I use at home are those where the artist is very present in their making, wheel thrown or hand-built. If it's too tight, I just I don't respond to it as well. I like the hand being involved. And so then now for the bottom of the plate. So I've got this really great sort of like pie crust edge now. I may not draw a circle, but I'm going to connect, do like a cross. And I don't sign my last name anymore in my work. There came to a point where I just really wanted to start using my middle name, my grandfather's name. So as I mentioned earlier, my, name, my middle name is Bige. That was my grandfather's name. People used to call him Ben or Mr. Benny. And there's just, for the longest time I used to, I don't want to say I was embarrassed by it, I just never really understood it. Why did it have to be different? Um, but now, as I've gotten older and really have understood more about my grandfather and identity of where I come from, I've really started embracing my middle name, Bige. And so I've been signing my work, Bige. So within the cross there, signing Bige, getting some more 
dots. Doing a few more regular spots. And any time that I've been at a pottery show and someone has picked up my work, two things are often said. I haven't done it yet, but I add a hole in the foot ring so that way the work can be hung up. My work is meant to be on display. It doesn't have to be, but I really want to have the opportunity for the purchaser uh, to hang it. Um, it's a print. It's a, it's a print on a pot. Um, and I have taken a lot of time to make sure that it's also functional. You can eat off of it. You can enjoy it. You can put it back on the wall. You can, its function can be display only. Its function can be utilitarian only. The other thing uh, that I find important, not only having a hook um, in the back of it, but is the, is the decoration, as I was mentioning, addressing the back. A lot of, a lot of people have really appreciated the attention all over. So flip it back around to do so. I'll just take the board, flip, and I'll dry plates pretty slowly. And that is it. So here is plate number one, plate number two. Don't worry, I won't forget to sign the bottom of the other one. And again, if you're interested in understanding more of these processes, other surface decoration techniques, uh, be sure to follow along a lot of my other videos here with the Archie Bray Foundation. Again, my name is Jason Baj Burnett. I'm the author of Graphic Clay. And so if you want to not only understand more of these techniques, I also have a chapter in there that talks about how to address the surface, thinking about composition, art elements and principles. So stay tuned for other videos. Thanks.